when when you're kind of in the guts of a of an FTP session and you're 45 minutes in and you're on the last block or even halfway through sometimes and it's blooming hard work um you know that you did it the week before and the week before that and and I think those those kind of that that build up to that sort of thing means knows that you can get through that sort of stuff um and it it's that focus for me it's that you know yes there weren't events this year but knowing that there was a structured plan that, uh, to get on with and, and execute against is that it was the big thing for me that's age grouper david naylor and you're listening to an age group special brought to you by the oxygen addict triathlon podcast Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Electrolytes in different strengths to match how you sweat. You can get 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. And we're also brought to you by GroupEvolution.com. Luxury triathlon training camps coached by Dave Scott at an exclusive 19th century French chateau. Use the code OxygenAddict15 for 15% off. Okay, everybody, welcome to the show. This week's interview is with age grouper David Naylor. Um, Dave's a great guy. I think you're really going to love this interview. He's got a really interesting story of how he got into triathlon. Um, He's been with us for about a year in the team and uh, his journey culminated in culminated even i should get my words right in him completing triathlon uh, outlaw x just recently so i think you're really going to enjoy listening to his story uh, it's a real cracker all right we should jump into news and results this week brought to you by our sponsors precision hydration remember you can book a free hydration call with our experts there's a link in the show notes mention that you heard about it on the oxygen triathlon podcast and you're entered to win a 50 pound precision hydration bundle you're gonna need to take care of your electrolyte intakes when you're training indoors this winter whether you're on the turbo or whether you're on the treadmill if you get hot you get sweaty you are going to lose an awful lot of fluid because you are getting rid of that heat and the electrolytes are the stuff that go with it. So if you're like me, and you're an exceptionally salty sweater, or you're a very heavy sweater, you need to get right on top of replacing those electrolytes. It's going to help you feel better after the workout. It's going to help you feel less thirsty after the workout, obviously. But crucially, it might well help you stop getting cramps. So if you're like me, if I get on the turbo trainer, I'm getting calf cramps sometimes before I even finish the session, and definitely if Um, in the evening in bedtime if I take precision hydration in the drink I just don't get it so I know it's only anecdotal evidence but it absolutely works brilliantly so if you take my advice you'll give them a go 15% off your first order with the code oxygenatic15 I absolutely love the product I think the company are fantastic the team behind it are great can't praise them highly enough all right things that we have noticed this week all right first of all I've got to talk about this you know me I'm a bike geek Canyon have just launched their new Speedmax. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, get on over to their website and check it out. They've done a brilliant job of the new bike, but also a brilliant job of the launch. They've pretty much, I mean, you can't miss it. So by the time you listen to this, I'm recording the night before it goes out live. There's already articles on all the major news, triathlon news websites. Uh, there's a great 45-minute video on GTN, which Mark and Heather do a brilliant job of talking about the bike. But super impressed by it it there were a lot of rumors about this and it looks like they've knocked the ball out of the park they've managed to get the integrated hydration there's a a bladder in the down tube but also crucially they've got some kind of mechanism where there's some kind of little nozzle thing you can just use a normal water bottle on the fly as you're riding or racing squirt the liquid down through and it goes into the bladder in the tube which which is amazing they've got a little storage compartment down by the cranks to put a tube and a couple of co2s in um they've got storage for liquid behind the saddle they've got fantastic integrated handlebar systems even on the what what they're describing as their sort of entry level bike now they've got fantastic solutions including i think like a hollowed out top tube by the look of things where you've got some kind of they call it like a an inflator snake where you can get two co2s into like a wrap of uh, a wrap of some kind of fabric and it slides into the top tube through the bento box and you can get your stuff in the bento box as usual on top so i've been super impressed by how it looks it's obviously not cheap but it was never going to be um but it looks absolutely amazing um they've got great videos up with the amfredino talking about it talking about their aero testing and get this the claiming 
that the frame of the bike itself is nine watts faster than the previous generation, which equates to about a four minute saving over an Ironman bike leg. And when you're stacking up things like, I don't know, changing to a decent set of race tires and butyl inner tubes over to, um, you know, really fast latex tubes, looking at two or three watt savings there. It's a very big saving to claim over what's already a very, very fast bike. So yeah, well done to the team at Canyon. Um, I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not being paid to say this. More's the pity. Canyon, if you're listening, love to do a review. Yeah, as if. Um, but I really love the way this product looks. I've, I've been a massive fan of Canyon's products for years. And my opinion, I think they've raised the bar for a range of tri bikes that have got everything covered from, you know, I'm going to say entry level, although there's nothing sort of entry level priced in terms of, you know, we're not at the £2,000 mark anymore. We're higher than 3000 But still, from that all the way through to the top end where you're spending over ten grand, it looks like a, a fantastic range. You know me, I'm a, a big Surveillor fanboy, but this has really turned my head. So get on over and check that out. All right, the next thing I want to talk about, just had a press release come through from the PTO. And um, this is a really big one for triathlon. The PTO have announced paid maternity leave for their female pro triathletes and actually paid paternity leave for you know for all their athletes as well but get this they're offering a 15 month paid paternity leave from the beginning of the pregnancy date and ending six months after birth the way it's going to work is at the time of the pregnancy her pto world ranking will be fixed during her maternity leave, she'll be paid monthly payments based on 100% of the PTO annual bonus plan in effect at the time. So if you were ranked fifth at the time, you'd be entitled to a $60,000 bonus payment at the end of the year. They're going to split that. So she would get paid $5,000 a month for the full 15 months, taking that to $75,000. Now, obviously, the people at the top of the tree are going to do better at this than the ones lower down, but that's massive. That's always been such a huge stumbling block with any of the any of the female pros we've talked to. You know, there is no gender parity in the sport in this way. If you don't race, you don't get paid. If you're lucky, you have sponsors who stick with you, but we only have to go back a couple of years to hear stories about huge international companies like Nike dropping athletes when they got pregnant not having maternity leave policy. So I think this is a massive step forward. I don't know of another governing body who's done something like this. And it might be that I'm just ignorant about that, but I just think it's fantastic. To quote from Rachel Joyce, who's the co-president of the PTO says, we're delighted to have adopted this maternity policy recognizes the unique reality women athletes face in trying to maintain a professional athletic career while balancing family planning. So fantastic you know really think it's good and at the end it says the pto has adopted a parental leave policy that will allow pto professionals who become parents to take up to four months parental leave from racing without it having an effect on the pto world ranking and related annual bonus payments so again you know a bit of gender parity both ways is fantastic for any triathletes pro triathletes who are starting a family so they are doing extremely good stuff for the sport you can go and check that out over at protriathletes.org and also interesting news here i'm really hopeful about this challenge daytona is obviously happening in just a couple of weeks time now i've got an interview to bring you it'll come out in the next couple of weeks with british pro tom davis who's talking about going over to daytona to race as well but the PTO have announced that because of you know the regulations around COVID, they recognize that press and media can't travel. So they're going to host what they're calling virtual media hub. They're going to have interviews available to people like us um, over the internet. So hopefully it's looking like we're going to get to do interviews and bring interviews to you over the show, taken in the, the pre-racing um press conference and the post-race press conference as well so i'm really hopeful i mean obviously i'd have loved to have gone over to daytona and covered the race live it's going to be such an amazing event especially with the way the year has been no question it's the biggest race on the calendar this year and arguably you know one of the if not the strongest fields assembled the way it's slightly shorter than 70.3 distance and we've got some of the best Olympic distance races in the world, as well as the best 70.3 and iron distance races. 
it really represents, I think, a true coming together of all the different disciplines for racing to see. You know, we want to know can Vincent Lewis hold it together over an 80k bike ride and a and a 16k run? Can Lionel Sanders take him down over that? Can Ali Brownlee take him down? Can Johnny Brownlee do it? I'm really interested to see how George Taylor Brown, just Lermonth, do against the established 70.3 racers. So it's going to be fantastic. And the chance to bring you some of the the interviews from before and after from around that would have been amazing to be over there for it. But I'm certainly not ready to fly yet. And, I, you know, there's lots of travel restrictions around anyway, even if people were willing to fly. I know it's a very big deal to get them travel passes and visas, etc., to get people into America. So, uh, so yeah, watch this space. Hopefully we'll be bringing you some interviews in just a couple of short weeks time. And last bit of news that I saw, Super League Triathlon have bought the Malibu Triathlon. So this represents a big time entry into, you know, big time American market. They've had races over there before. I think combining the pro races, SLT, with the race that's already there at Malibu. Malibu is already a massive, famous event. They get tons of celebrities which raise, you know, raise the profile massively already. I think it's a genius move on behalf of the uh, SLT to get that race on board. I think with the marketing brains that they've got and the different innovative race formats they've got, they'll combine it with what's already there at Malibu and it will do absolutely shed loads for their profile and for that image and for the sport in general over in America. So Michael and Chris over there have done a brilliant job as well, I think. And last up, it looks like there'll be another race happening this coming weekend. It looks like 70.3 Texas is still on. Obviously, you know, that's things change pretty quickly at the moment. So I'm sitting here Tuesday with my fingers crossed that anyone lined up to race 70.3 Texas actually gets to race. All right, so before we go over to this week's interview of the week, I want to give a shout out quickly to our sponsors, groupevolution.com. Dave Scott is doing two triathlon clinics in Europe next year. First time ever triathlon clinics in Europe. They're running on the 8th to the 14th of April and the 15th to the 21st of April. They're being held in an amazing 19th century French chateau surrounded by a moat. They've got their own 25 meter pool there. There's an open water venue nearby. There's quiet roads to ride on. There's a running track nearby. And did I mention Dave Scott? Legend Dave Scott coaching. It is your probably your only chance this year to get coached by Dave and attend a training camp with the man himself in Europe, certainly. Um, prices are incredibly reasonable compared to the prices I've seen that get charged for his camps over in Hawaii. So if you are ever thinking about treating yourself to a an amazing training experience and get to spend seven days training alongside and being coached by Dave Scott. This is the chance for you. So there's a link in the show notes to click. You go over and check that out. And you can also follow the link straight through groupevolution.com. Um, and we can offer you a 15% discount using the code oxygenatic 15. If you sign up by the end of Christmas Eve, um, I don't know whether to announce this. I'm going to, I'm going to announce it anyway. Dave Scott's going to come back on the show in a couple of weeks time. We're going to talk about his camp and we're going to talk about some other stuff I've got lined up as well. Um, dead excited. Actually only got the email through literally a couple of hours back to confirm it's going to happen. So I'm going to have Dave back on the show. So I'm going to put some stuff out on social. If you've got questions for the man, we're going to have you uh, in a position to ask them and I'll ask them for you and you get questions straight back from him. So again, that's 8th to the 14th of April and 15th to the 21st of April in France. Uh, They've got a fantastic COVID secure environment and also a COVID guarantee that has you pay one pound deposit. So get that one pound deposit to secure your place and total money back guarantee if you can't go because you've got covid or because of travel restrictions all the details are over on the website so read all the legal details over there all right guys that takes us beautifully to this week's interview of the week with our age grouper fantastic age group story with david naylor okay dave welcome to the show thank you very much for joining us thank you for having me on this beautiful thursday afternoon as we sit in here watching the sun slowly sink away into the horizon outside yeah, I, I can see that quite nicely from this office window. It disappears over the back of the garden, and it gets re- <laughs> it gets it gets replaced by a satellite which sits on the uh, windowsill. Uh, this Is that time, right? yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love it, love it. So, listen, let's talk a little bit about your 
your journey into triathlon. Um, but let's start that by talking about your life outside of triathlon. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you do for a living, family life, work life, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, okay. So um, I, I'm from the north of England. I live in Leeds. Um, I've got the Yorkshire Dales literally on my doorstep. Nice. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I quite enjoy listening to people talk about um, hilly routes and um, big climbs because literally everything that we've got out there is hilly and a big climb. I live on the side of the valley, so it's always up or down to get in or out. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place to be ultimately. Uh, and I, I enjoy riding the bike. I'm, I'm riding the motorbike out there, actually. Um, but, yeah, so live in Leeds. Um, I've got a, a wife and two kids. So I've got a, a, a my eldest has just gone to high school uh my youngest is uh six years old her bubbles just burst at school so she's currently floating wow. around the house for the next two weeks really? unfortunately yeah is that what they uh, say these days the bubbles the burst bubbles, the bubbles burst yeah i think so <laughs> yeah <laughs> i, think that's, I like that's that a new term yeah um and yeah i work um in technology so i work as a chief technology officer for a, a company um in leeds um developing lots of fancy software around data um and uh, data science and things like that so um yeah quite a quite a techie person at heart and i love all of the data that um triathlon gives me um in terms of all of the kind of hrv stuff and the stuff in training peaks and my aura ring and all the bits that go with it i'm all over the data so yeah nice and so what was your what was your path into triathlon then how have you have you ended up in triathlon and uh, and how's it integrated into your life um it's a bit of a, a strange one for me really i mean I've, i i've done two triathlons in my life um one this year and one in 2015 so in in, in 2015 i did the brownlee try um which was at um, harewood house or howard house depending on what what area of yorkshire you're from um <laughs> and um and i enjoyed that um i you know i it was something that i did instead of road running i'd, I'd done the great north run for something like six or seven years in a row and I'd, I'd kind of I always needed an event to work towards so I always kind of stuck the great north in at the end of the year um and kind of ran for that but I fancied something different and tried that and and then they never really thought about it again and I think probably the bigger thing was that I didn't really have an awareness about anything beyond what I'd just done which I think was a sprint um and yeah it's just um you know I was uh, plodding along in terms of work and home um and then I had a, a I had a, a an event at work, and it was way back in 2016, actually. Um, and um, ultimately, that kind of led me on on a slippery slope towards a kind of mental health battle, if you like. Um, the, the trigger was something that had kicked off at work, um, which almost lost me my job the day after we'd moved into a house that we probably couldn't afford. Um, so it was kind of like a perfect storm, if you like. Yeah. Um, it was stressful enough moving. It was even more stressful the week I got back to work and almost got walked back out the door. Um, you know, it wasn't a terrible event. It was just a, a software uh, release hadn't gone to plan. And ultimately, I was at the top of the pile of, of responsibility for that one. So it was a bit of a bit of a kind of um, a challenge, if you like, to navigate my way through that. Um, and ultimately, I kind of, lost my way a little bit with work and um and it made me um quite poorly i think i was at, i was at the point where you know i was driving into work and um sitting in the car park for 10 15 minutes before i went in um not ashamed to say that there were some tears every so yeah. often and the wor the worst part was that um it got really bad and you know i i used to go to, i used to commute to work on the motorbike and um more than once the thought crossed my mind that it would be quite easy to not actually arrive at the destination if that makes sense yeah. um, so I, I wasn't in a good place um and i kind of stayed in that role for about four or five months in that position um and then decided that i needed to do something about that and obviously the biggest issue for me was the work situation so i so i moved on um and actually i took a big step up um in terms of role and responsibility which is probably not the most sensible thing to do when you're feeling like i felt but um ultimately it was you know i knew that i could do the work that i was employed to do and i knew that i had something to offer and i, and I moved on um and yeah i mean i guess first couple of years of that role career was on the up really really going well in terms of work but there was always this this thing bubbling in the background and it kind of probably came to a head um 2018-ish i think um and um you know I, I probably did have a mental breakdown it wasn't like an official one it wasn't it's not on my uh, kind of um, health certificate if you like but you know I, I'm, I'm fairly confident i did have one um and i was in that i was in that position at that point where you know you, you kind of 
you look at all these people in the world and I mean you were talking um around Dave Scott a few weeks back on the podcast about this sort of stuff and I was thinking to myself my career is going really well financially we're secure I've got absolutely no right to feel like this I was just kind of like that kind of macho male that refused to accept that there was something going on effectively um but it was there and it came to a head ultimately and um I think it was getting to the point where where, where Laura and the kids were getting affected by it and at that point um you know I need I knew I needed to kind of fix what was what was wrong basically um and you know, the kids were young they had no idea but uh, once I'd finally actually opened up and talked to somebody about it which was Laura she knew and she gave me a bit of a kick up the bump to go go and get this fixed essentially <laughs> yeah. um and yeah, so we were probably in late 2018 by that point. And I, I started um, a CBT course. Um, and I guess what I learned the most from that was that what I was feeling was perfectly normal. Everybody felt that. And it's the way that your mind works and it's the way that you manage your mind ultimately that gets you through some of the situations that you find yourself in. And I think the big thing for me was I learned how to take time over situations and reinterpret the outcomes um based on the inputs if you like and i really managed to kind of work my way through what was going on you know the, the smallest thing would trigger me and um as if i could reinterpret those small inputs and turn them into positive outcomes then that was the big thing for me and that was really the turning point um and then so we probably get to about 2019 and um i'm kind of looking for something to keep my mind busy looking for some sort of focus still nothing to do with triathlon at this point in time by the way um i decided in my infinite wisdom to buy a car from a salvage auction um <laughs> and basically i want i wanted i, I had the motorbike I, I enjoyed the motorbike um but i wanted a toy and i wanted a kind of two-seater convertible car i was looking at porsche boxes at the time and I, I, I say to this day that I accidentally pressed submit on the bid that I put in to win this BMW Z4. And it was completely knackered. It was it had been in a crash and basically from the front end, all of the front end was gone. All the way underneath the car was ripped to pieces and the back wheel was basically torn off. And it arrived on this pickup, uh, on this flatbed truck and rolled off and it's the bumpers scraping along the drive and it gets onto the drive and there's fluids all over the place and I'm like what the hell have I done um but ultimately it gave me I, I spent four months basically stripping this car back and rebuilding it getting the parts off off the various places on the internet it cost me an absolute fortune it's I mean I'm never selling it put it that way because I've put so much money into it and it's just it's worth about two grand so <laughs> it was completely pointless but it was brilliant for me because it gave it gave my my very busy mind from a very I've got a very stressful and, and kind of high profile job if you like with a lot of responsibility and it gave me that kind of disconnect and it gave me something to focus on outside of that um anyway i built this car up and 2019 in the summer i went on a stag weekend um, and i met a couple of guys that had just come off doing ironman bolton um and you know these were normal lads um we, we were on a stag weekend we were enjoying ourselves and i just thought to myself you know i, I kind of got an awareness i knew that the iron men exist uh, that iron man existed should i say um but i was like you know if they can do it anyone can do it and um and that's what it took for me to kind of you know come home from that weekend and start looking at, at what i could kind of do next because the car was finished and I, I knew i needed something else to occupy me ultimately um so i decided to sign up for the outlaw half um in nottingham the, yeah. um, this year's outlaw half in nottingham and i looked at the training plan for it and i was like oh, that's quite quite a lot of, quite a lot involved in being being ready for this sort of thing um and I looked at kind of what I needed to do to get there. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do a half and I'm going to do all that training, what's the difference between doing a half and a full? So I uh, I decided to sign up for Ironman Bolton. Obviously, these guys had done it. I was like, you know, they say it's hilly, but, you know, I, I live in the hills, so it can't be that bad. So I signed up for Bolton as well. Um, and at that point, I was kind of, right, how do I train for this? There's obviously a big commitment here, and that's really good for me because that's what I need. That's what my mind needs, to some, something to focus on, if you like. Um, and I looked at, I got the BI and Fit book for, by Don Fink and I looked through that and I was like, that, that'll do me, I'll do that. And then I, and then I came across um, you guys um, because you were working in partnership with Outlaw for the for the event. So I had a chat with Andy about the um, the coaching plan and, and what you guys were doing. I think at that time you had like an offer for like a pound for the first month or something like that. So it was kind of a case of, 
there's nothing to lose by doing that and seeing what it's like. Um, and the key thing for me speaking to you was, um, you know, the argument was you can do the Don Fink and many, many people do that and complete an Ironman because of it. But it's written in a way um, where you kind of southern hemisphere and you've got an awful lot of work to do in the crappy winter. And if anything changes and you miss a week or two on that plan, you're pretty much done for. Whereas if you follow a structured coaching plan, you've got the, you've got the kind of reactiveness to, to what's going on yeah. around you and it's structured yeah. around you. Um, and that was enough for me, really. I did the month, um, loved the training and then obviously introduced to the other side of it, which, you know, we don't, I think, you know, the, the thing about what you guys do, which is, I mean, I've got, no, I haven't got a yardstick to compare it to, but ultimately from, from my personal point of view, it's the team that comes with it that you don't really, you know, that's money can't buy sort of um, stuff. And that together with the training plan and the, and the community that we've built up around it, that was the key for me. Um, and then 2020 happened. <laughs> um, and, and that and that and that and it blew, all, really, blew all the plants blew out of the water <laughs> well, it blew the plants out of the water but it also uh, you know the focus wasn't lost because i knew that it was still there and it would be the year after but the most important thing was if i was still following that don think plan i guarantee sitting here today i wouldn't be training because ultimately i would have been on my own i wouldn't have known where to go and what to do uh, what to do next and the reactiveness around this year and you know even the virtual events that we've done have been key to kind of keeping that focus for everybody. So, yeah, that's the routine, really. Um, bit of a long-winded tale of how I got there, um, but started with with proper training um, on the. I was looking through training peaks the other day, actually, on the first of December. That's when the boxes started going green. Yeah, if you like yeah. to say to the team, um, and um, yeah, just worked my way through through this year with that. So we've done a couple of the virtual events, and and fi- thankfully we managed to kind of box off the year with outlaw x um so yeah managed to get one event in this year and and next year i've probably done off more than i can chew but um you know i'm going to blame ah. the fact that everything's been referred that's not it's not my fault <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah so that's that's how i got into triathlon and and that's the i mean ultimately the year i've had with with the team and the progress that i've made is i feel like i've not done anything yet although we completed outlaw x um, I kind of want to include that as a half, but because the swim was shown, I feel like I'm cheating. Um, no, we're going to give you that one. Work. We're going to so, give you that as a yeah, half for sure, yeah, definitely. Thank, yeah, it was hard work, so thank you. <laughs> I think I think one of the big challenges this year f- for a lot of people who are in a similar position to you is sometimes you need to see it before you believe it, mm. and it's fine me and Andy sitting here with our coaching hats on and saying, no, you're definitely making progress. And it's even arguable. You can see that in your, your power numbers going up and your run speed and swim speed coming down. But ultimately, if you don't have an event to sort of recalibrate your idea of where you are relative to what you thought you could do, it becomes a kind of unknown still. Um, I remember it's a bit like when, when we were kids, when I started track running, our track got dug up the year I started doing it and we couldn't do any real track running or any track sessions or race for an entire summer. And so the next summer we came in and we weren't really sure what our level of fitness was because we hadn't had a real track to train or race on all year. And that first race back, we were all so much further forward in terms of speed and time than we thought we should be. It's like we all had to immediately recalibrate where we were in our heads. And I think it's going to be the same for a lot of athletes next year because you've essentially done an entire year's worth of training. And well, it's, it's great you got Outlaw X and at the end of the year, but Imagine if you hadn't, you'd have had all that yeah. training and still yeah. not really know kind yeah, of where well, you are in a in an event fitness kind of way. Yeah, and I think I think I'm really thankful for getting out of Rx because of that. Um I mean they did an amazing job of, of of putting that on and the way that it was done in in, in a COVID secure way, honestly, unbelievable. Yeah. Um yeah, it was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. And I think, you know, again, back to that kind of that that mind state that I've learned to kind of progress with and you know i'm all about the kind of mindfulness help self-help books um um, that that kind of help me understand what's going on around that sort of thing but i think you know the ability to reinterpret 2020 and actually i think to myself do you know what i probably could have done bolton in july this year 
but I wouldn't have done it comfortably, I don't think. You know, effectively, I went from nothing in December, still not been able to swim up until probably about a month ago. I couldn't do proper freestyle swimming. So I would have definitely been doing that free, uh, with breaststroke. And um, I can go from banking all the training this year and hopefully go moving from a kind of complete mode to a compete mode next year. And yeah. that's the key thing for me. You know, I've done Outlaw X. And to be fair, you know, I've I, I finished halfway down the field i did it um 541 or 537 something like that i can't remember the the exact number um there's not, nothing to be kind of um shirked on that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good, good time yeah yeah it's a really and it good would have been time. better if my body hadn't have fallen apart on the run it would have been a lot better as well so <laughs> um so yeah i think i'm looking forward to next year with that in mind ultimately that you know i've got effectively two years worth of or at least a year and a half worth of kind of training in the bank and two winter blocks which is probably the biggest thing yeah. so yeah yeah well you've obviously got you've obviously got quite a, a large amount of self-belief to enter an ironman before you can even swim front crawl i love that i love stories like this where you you kind of go yeah i, I met these guys we're in a stag do they'd done it sounded good signed up i love that yeah. stuff because yeah. I think so many people hold themselves back by either thinking that they can't or worse being told by, you know, people at the club or whatever, oh no, you need to be three years in before you can contemplate entering Ironman. If that's the thing that sets you on fire, get in and get it entered. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I, you know, I wasn't going to drown. I can do breaststroke and there's no shame in doing breaststroke. Um, but I didn't want to. I, I really wanted to nail the front crawl. I remember when I did the Brownlee try in 15, I, I, I tried to do front crawl. I took like a couple of kind of lessons in, in a group and I just I couldn't do it. Um, and this year, um, you know, from the point of where I was in December with swimming, again, I took a couple of lessons then, but I, I was in a 15 metre pool and all the technique that you learn in 15 meters you crashed into the end of the world before you know it so um so there's no point really so but yeah i spent all year kind of working on it but i did get into i did get into a state with the swimming where again it was kind of it was more of a mental battle for me and 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 it, it literally um it was six weeks ago that i managed to do my first 100 meters without stopping yeah, I in, remember. in the pool yeah um and it and it took somebody else in the team that had started from a very similar place to me but a lot much later on completing that milestone for me to think well you know what every time i go in the pool i'm carrying my pool boy with me and i, and I hug it for dear life and i don't and i never let go and i did all of my swimming blocks up this year with the pool boy and i have to get rid of that that that's my safety blanket i don't need that um let, let's crack on and see what i can do so 50 meters yeah i can do that 75 i can do that but it's hard work but what's 25 meters after that yeah. so so i pushed through and i did it and then the day after i went back to the pool because it was the first time i actually enjoyed myself in the pool and i was like well if i can do 100 what, what's 200 meters so i did that as well and that and what it showed me was that you know it's 90 percent mental isn't it it's i mean swimming is awful in terms of if you've not got a, a base of technique which i didn't have at the time I was, I was, I can be so much more efficient with what I'm doing, but I can build on that. I just need to make sure I can break that glass ceiling and, and push through those, those distances, first of all. And then, yeah, the, a couple of weeks, in fact, was it last week was test week? And I was, that was my milestone. In fact, I've got it in training peaks as a goal, which I've now ticked off for the year, which is complete a CSS test in freestyle on my own. And I've done it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I did enter not being able to do front crawl um i can do it now can i can i go the distance no not yet but i know that i will be able to and that's the key thing and you know talking about kind of doing things that scare you was as i think it was um jess that was on the podcast the week that said that i possibly are i can't remember um but even before i'd broken those swim barriers i entered next year's iron man island and I know about, I know all about the swim on that one. <laughs> so um, <laughs> no, if I, it sometimes doesn't happen because it's that bad. But do you know what? That's fine. Um, I I kind of I probably do have that that mental strength now, but it's taken me a while to get there with it. Um, and it's confidence as much as anything in what's possible. And I think that's this year showing me that more than anything is that you know I started where I was. I'm 18% faster running. I've got a CSS that I can be happy with. You know, I've actually got a clean sweep in the 10% club for the team, which I, I calculated last night. I need to, I need to get onto Andy about getting my hat. 
<laughs> that's my that's my exercise snack alarm going off. I'll, I'll do that later. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I think it is it is about that kind of it's that you know knowing what's possible ultimately and and knowing that you know the normal people that have got busy days and busy jobs um, can do it as well. And you know what my my positions very very easy compared to some guys in the team. You know, I I, I don't work shifts. I work I work long hours sometimes highly stressful but but nothing compared to some of the guys that are out there doing this stuff day to day um so do you know what i've got no right to to kind of complain and the training that we do is, is for me it's very easy to, to fit in especially now that we're at home because you know i would i would i'd get up in the morning and, and jump on the bike at 6 30 a.m before i have to get on the commute to, to work now i can get on the bike at eight o'clock jump off have a shower and i'm, I'm at work by 10 past nine because it's literally down the steps so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about your training then, and and how you do fit that in. What does your what does your standard training week look like? Well, let's take it outside of lockdown to start with, but then you know, talk a little bit about how it is different during during lockdown. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 fairly. I mean, we, obviously, if the, if the pools are open, it's slightly different because we've we've potentially got two sessions to do a day. But what I I like to get the bag out of the way and and done in the morning, although. I've uh, I've been drawn to the power hours over summer um, and and done them in the evenings. But then I've missed strength and conditioning because I've done that. Um, because you know you get off you get off the power hour and you kind of like oh, I've got to do strength and conditioning now, and it's and it's quite easy not to do that. And then you slide into the day after and the day after that, and you just tend not to do it. So I've really tried to focus in on on, on dealing with some of that stuff. Um, so yeah, get the bikes out of the way in the morning, so the Tuesday and Thursday bike sessions. Um, and then similarly, I'll, I'll actually swim um, when the pools are open um, before I, before I start work on Wednesdays and Fridays. And then uh, the runs. Um, I mean, one of the thing one of, one of the people that's benefited most from me doing triathlon is the dog, because he loves <laughs> a good run. Um, and uh, you know, I, I remember when we were doing uh, brick runs um, earlier in the summer, and I sort my trainers out before I jumped on the bike and he'd literally be sat waiting for me at the end of the bike for me to get off the bike and put my trainers on so we could go out for a run um, Brilliant. so yeah just uh it's it's you know for me it's during the week at least it's it's get the long stuff out of the way in the morning um fuel yourself up get cracking on with the day and then at least you've got the time in the evening as well with the kids and and, and you can kind of focus on on family life as as, as much as anything else um and again with with where we are in terms of lockdown at the moment um getting the runs done during the day you know grab, grab an hour for your lunch and, and go out and do your run um i do tend to go off piste a little bit with the runs sometimes though because i do most of them on trail runs rather than road runs um there's literally woods just down the road there and it's a lot easier to, to run with the dog in the in the woods but it makes e-pace a bit of a challenge sometimes yeah, yeah i'm i'm in a similar position i've got a bunch of woods behind my house and and i do a yeah. similar thing in it and and i think you do have to let go of you've got to let go of the sort of there is a specific pace here for a specific reason and just kind yeah. of go i'm running at about that intensity and that's fine as long mm. as i'm not going too hard but i'm a massive fan of exercising in nature when you possibly yeah. can yeah the opportunity to be in the woods it's it's the best thing yeah, and and then and then obviously with the, the weekends, um, the the long rides are you know I try not to do them on as much as I can really. Um, I've, I've got no excuse where I am in terms of in terms of my the area of the world that I live in to get out on the bike and get them get them done. Um, and you know, as I said earlier, um, that's not a hill. This is a hill. <laughs> so yeah. you know, some some of the ones that that, that I go up and down, um, great fun. I, I usually fin- I usually finish off the ride um i, I kind of go back around the back of the dales and then come back for a skips in an ilkley way so you've okay. got um you've got the cow and calf which is at the top of ilkley and it goes over the mars and that's the last big climb and it's, it's where the where the kind of road races go around there and the, all the roads painted up like it's like, almost like you're going up the alp for, for 30 seconds <laughs> so nice. it's quite nice that to just then it's a nice flat run home after that so yeah talk to us a bit about outlaw x what was your experience there like because obviously that was a it was a big step up in distance, wasn't it, from having only done a sprint before? Yeah, um, I mean, it was. I loved it to be honest. It was. It was great. I think the weekend was great. Meeting everybody on the team was amazing. Um, for me, um, I kind of when when the uh, when the note came through late that night that the swim was shot, and that I was kind of like, I mean, 
like most people, I think probably secretly happy. I mean, I, there was no doubt I was breaststroking that entire thing. So um, for me, it was okay, but, but my God, it was cold. Um, it took it took a bit of getting used to. Um, and then we'd, we'd actually done a route recce uh, two weeks before that. So I knew exactly what to expect on the bike. Um, and it was windier that day by far. Um, but yeah, really enjoyed it um, on the bike. And, and I think it was really funny, actually, because one of the things that... Um, that, that you kind of do with the, when you're planning for that race, especially with the team, is you kind of talk, you, you look at your power numbers and you look at what's sustainable for you and it's your race and it's it's it's, it's you against you, effectively, based on what you've done this year. So I was riding my power and I, and I, and I put this in my, in my write-up at the time. I was like, there was one guy, um, his name was Glenn. I'll never forget his name or his face, actually. Um, and he, he kept busting past me um, and you know, it didn't bother me at all for the first couple of times. And then it, it, it happened again. And I wasn't chasing him. I was just riding my numbers um, on the power meter. Um, and I go past him. And it, it must have happened about 10 or 15 times by the time we got back to Forestby Park. And in the end, we were about two miles out. Uh, and I went past him again on the kind of flat run in. Um, and, I, and I, I heard him swear at me or around me, should I say. And, and, and he just totally got red mist and went for it. And it disappeared into the distance. And I was just laughing at that point. I was like, well, um, I've, uh, as David Goggins would say, that's, a, that's one soul taken. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, I, and I jumped off the bike, um, got out on the run. And probably within the first half mile, there, there he was. I tapped him on the shoulder and wished him good luck and never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really funny that um really enjoyed it but yeah the bike the bike the, for me biking's probably i mean for most people i guess it's the easiest bit but the thing i struggle with the most is running um and i get past a certain kind of time running probably around 45 50 minutes and my feet fall to pieces on me um and it really happened badly on that day um i was um you know three laps around that course and probably one and a half laps in started to really struggle with it and I get I get this really kind of bad burning sensation all the way up my feet um and it was a, a bit of a lonely run to be honest I didn't see many people um certainly from the team or anybody that I knew obviously because of the situation we were in um the family weren't there to kind of give yeah. me a kick every lap to kind of get yeah, me around yeah. um and I remember every time I did see somebody from the team it gave you that little bit of kind of uh, in, uh, you know that burst of, of kind of speed um and then I came around the kind of final corner um and there everybody was screaming and uh, I didn't, I don't, I quite, don't quite know how I managed to speed up around that last bit because I didn't have anything left. Um, but I did, but yeah, the run, I did it in two hours and five and I was hoping for kind of like a one forty-five, and I probably would have done it. But as I say, the body just let me down at that point. And I'm thinking to myself when I cross the line, Christ, I've got to do that times two. Um, and maybe I need to have a, have a look at these feet and, and, and figure out what's wrong with them because it had happened multiple times through the year when we, when we'd gone and done the long runs. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, uh, I really enjoyed the event. And as I say, I kind of, I did it in, um, five, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look behind me. Sorry. Cause my, what, this is my birthday present. Um, oh, my that's nice. nobody can see this on, on the thing, but it's a, it's a frame with all the bits in it. So, um, yeah, it was five thirty seven and one second and the bike three hours and 33 seconds. <laughs> so the 33 seconds, um, I'm, I'm making a habit of getting close to those. those yeah. Those, those numbers, magic I'm, numbers. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I got back from that and, um, I decided that I needed to kind of have, have, have a look at myself biomechanically. So I went and saw, uh, first of all, first thing Monday morning was, um, a sports massage cause I was broken. Um, and he kind of took one look at me and said, your, your shape's a bit funny here. You, you, you've got your kind of your shoulders are, are the wrong way and your, your pelvis is the wrong way. Your muscles are all tight around the wrong bits. You need to go and see a, a podiatrist. So I went to see a podiatrist um, the, day, the day after, actually. Um, and he took one look at me and he, and he said, tell me again what you did this weekend. I told him. And, and, he, and he went, I'm not entirely sure how you managed that. And I said, why? And he was like, well, you're a corkscrew. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, so he basically says, your, your pelvis tips down and left. And because of that, your shoulders are twisted up and right. And it's all coming from your ankle. Um, and effectively, I've been operating probably for the past eight years on, the, on a semi-dislocated ankle because I've I rolled it really badly playing football. 
um, okay. many years ago and I, and I proper did the tendons on it. Um, and I did it the night before we went on holiday for two weeks degree. So I obviously didn't get it looked at because oh, I would have been shouted no. at by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So I went on holiday with a really bad swollen foot and it never really got fixed after that. And it's always niggled me. Um, and yeah, basically he's, he's manipulated my foot, turned it one way, hit it the other and it cracked into place. And immediately my pelvis was straight and my shoulders were straight. Um, and, and I was like, oh, okay. So he's like, you know, he said to me, I don't entirely know how you've run that distance, but well done. Um, <laughs> but, but, but now, but now let's fix this and get you some orthotics fitted. Um, and so that's happened now, actually, I've just finished wearing them in and I can start running in them now. So I'm hoping that biomechanically, at least I'll be able to kind of do that long stuff pain free because yeah. it was horrible before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big step, isn't it? When, when you can immediately feel a difference when you've worked with a physio or a podiatrist or whoever, when they change something and immediately yeah. you can feel that difference and think, oh, right. Okay. Okay. I well, see how this is supposed to feel. Well, that, that, that first, that first kind of manipulation, I'll call it, um, that he did, um, you know, I, when I run and I look down, I can see, I could see my knee and my foot turning out and my knee twisting, especially up hills. And for the first two weeks, um, until I got the orthotics fitted, um, or even up to that point, it was, it was amazing. Um, I could look down, I just felt better. Yeah. And I think it helped, I think it helped the swim as well, to be honest. It was around that time where my swimming started to improve because I could, I could straighten my foot. And obviously before I was dragging an anchor behind me effectively. Yeah, um, of course. So yeah, don't, don't ignore that stuff is, is the message there, I suppose. And if there's anything niggly, just go and get it looked at because, you know, it could be a massive fix for, for not a great deal of outlay really. So yeah. 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 Interesting. And so looking forward to next year then, obviously if things get rolled back, are you still, you've still got Outlaw Half and I'm on UK in the horizon for next year. No, so Iron Man, yes. Outlaw half, I moved to Outlaw X. To Outlaw um, X, okay. Yeah. So, but next year's, um, yeah, I've got I've got the um, Epic Man half as a warm up to to Bolton. Um, nice. So you know that's a that's hilly. Bolton's hilly. Let's do them things together. Um, and then I've got Island on the fifteenth of August. That's full distance. And then Bowwood, um, and then. Um, I've got it. I've got it. I'm looking at my um, events plan and I haven't booked this yet, but I've got Outlaw X Run Redemption marked in there. So I really want to do it, but I've got a really busy year. So if you kind of look at from, from 15th of August, I've got Ireland and then the 12th of September is Bowwood and then the 26th of September is X. So it's probably a little bit much, to be honest. So I might, I might wait for X for a year. Um, well, maybe you get the redemption by going and having a decent run at Bowwood. Maybe exactly. that's, the, yeah. maybe that's yeah. the redemption yeah. that you get. Yeah, and then at the back end of the year, I've got two marathons that are deferred from this year. So I've got uh, the Manchester Marathon and the Yorkshire Marathon, and they're a week apart. So again, one of them <laughs> might have to get sacrificed. <laughs> so, I love how you're slipping all this in during the interview so that I can't yeah, remind you too hard. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't done the race plan yet. <laughs> and, and when I do, those won't be going on it. <laughs> yeah, so, we'll be talking yeah. about at least one of those near the time. <laughs> no, I'm aware. I mean, yeah. I love it great stuff so listen you mentioned before about building the car yeah about stripping it down and getting the bits and rebuilding all of that do you have a similar approach with your bikes have you have you found that translation of interest into bike tinkering that you had with car tinkering um honestly no and i think probably the reason for that is because i i got a brand new bike in january um and therefore I didn't need to do a great deal of tinkering with that. However, um, that was a road bike. So I got the uh, Cannondale System 6. Um, lovely bike. I've got yeah. some nice, nice bars on it, um, some TT bars. And that's what I did X on. Um, but it was kind of like I looked at the time of X and I looked at the people that were kind of doing 20 minutes less than me, probably a, an awful lot less effort. And that was the sales pitch anyway in, in yeah. the house um, yeah. to, to get myself a TT bike. So I've I've just got hold of um, a P3, um, and I'm going to get that fitted um, at the end of December with Matt Bottrell. Um, nice. So that one probably does need some tinkering, but I'm kind of in the position of don't touch it until I've seen Matt because there's no point basically. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I'm not I'm not the most kind of um, I mean I've instead I've rebuilt a car. It was pretty much kind of bodywork, and the bit that I couldn't do was the back wheel. So a lot of a lot of YouTube. 
um, videos were watched. And, you know, I stripped the front of the engine off, but that was probably about it. So I'm not the most kind of mechanically minded person. If you stick a computer in front of me and I'll sort that out, no problem. Um, I find it baffling yeah. that you can say you're, you're not the most mechanically minded person. There's nobody I know, apart from people who run garages, who can strip a car down. If you can do that, you can I'll, tinker with your bike. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll share the Google album with, with you of the car as well. You won't believe how, how, how bad it was. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I, I, I haven't needed to touch the bikes, to be honest. And, and it, I think that's one area, and especially, you know, because... I mean, we were we were talking to Matt the other day about the gains that you can get, and I don't know anything about aerodynamics and any of the things that go with it. The bike that I've got has got Di2 on it. It's got uh, I've just had it kind of serviced. It's got some new head bearings and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately, I have no idea what I'm doing with it. I don't even know if the seat is in the right position for me, um, and therefore I might as well just go and see an expert on that sort of Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely, the, the, the gains yeah. that I'll get from seeing him, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there'll be a, a big difference. And and doing it now. Um, means that the entire training block I use to train in that new position as well. So uh, yeah. that's the plan at least. Smart. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then to bring it full circle, then we started off talking about mental health and awareness mm. around mental health. How have you found regular training help support that? Massively, absolutely massively. Um, something to focus on first of all, but that that um, that kind of rush that you get um is is the big thing for me um and ultimately as well um you know when you're when when you're kind of in the guts of a of an ftp session and you're 45 minutes in and you're on the last block or even halfway through sometimes and it's blooming hard work um you know that you did it the week before and the week before that and and i think those those kind of that that build up to that sort of thing means knows that you can get through that sort of stuff um and it it's that focus for me it's that you know yes there weren't events this year but knowing that there was a structured plan uh, to get on with and, and execute against is that it was the big thing for me um and yeah um it, it it's made a huge difference i mean i was just thinking uh, yesterday um i had a, a really really busy day i was literally back to back meetings lots of stress i kind of finished the day at six o'clock and went upstairs and and I had the run to do and and there's this this kind of you know um there was one part of my mind that was like yeah just just don't do it but the other part of it was you need this um you need to just release all of the crap from the day and get your ass out and run and I did it and and um, Laura asked me um if I felt better when I got back in and I was like do you know what I've not even thought since I walked through the door, I've not thought one thing negative, one thing bad. You know, I've not thought about the, the day at work. I was like, the easy answer to that is yes, because my it just cleaned my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it makes a huge difference. Um, and I think you know, I've I'm a big kind of believer in in kind of you know learning more about that sort of thing as well. Um, I've I've kind of been through free audio books this year which have had a, a big impact on, on that sort of thing and help with the training as well um you know i mentioned david goggins earlier about taking souls and i would read his book can't hurt me and you know if you can if you can sift through the kind of macho just do it stuff in that book it's not not the most kind of um it, it doesn't plan as much as you probably ought to it's fair to say in, in in that book but it's all about mind over muscle effectively and the fact that you know you can do these things um and um you know talking about the training i remember when we were doing the um lakesman in lockdown event and um i was listening to the art of resilience by ross edgley at, when i was on the run um and i'm my feet had done the usual thing of falling apart after about an hour and 40 minutes and it was agony like literally every footstep was hurting me and i, and I knew i was kind of like four miles from home i was running the loop and i was at the point point in the book where he was basically talking about the fact that his wetsuit had created this wound around his entire neck and he had to he had to do a sprint across a shipping channel um on the on the south coast to get across before the boats came in and i was thinking to myself my feet hurt and he did that <laughs> so just get on with it basically um <clears throat> and yeah i think that that sort of thing is massively helpful for me but the big one that i mean this was you know the if you haven't listened to this it's it, for me it's, it changed my life actually uh, and i wish i'd have had it 
in 2016 and 17 when I really needed it. But the chimp paradox, yeah, what, what a book that is because yes. that just, that just helped me understand what was going on with me, and it and it's translatable to every single thing that you do in life, training, work, family, everything. It's it's made me a better dad because I can kind of relate to what's going on with my soon to be teenager. Um, and ultimately it's, um, it's allowed me to kind of realize that, you know, when, when, he, when that chimp wants you to stop, you can manage that. And, and I've called him, I've called mine Barry. Um, <laughs> so, so I've actually given him a name and, and, you know, no, no disrespect to any Barry's that I know, by the way, when I've called him Barry, <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, it allows me to kind of really process what's going on in my mind. Um, and, and that's a, that's a really good book for that sort of thing. Um, and it, and it's helped massively apply some of the things that we do in training, some of the, some of the difficult sessions, um, all of them together have kind of, you know, helped with that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I think if, if, if you look at the journey that I've been on fitness wise, it's not just body, it's mind. And I'm, I'm in such a good place now compared to where I was. Um, and you know, I'm a hell of a lot fitter than this time last year as well, which is great. So good man. Brilliant. Well, do you know what, mate? I think that's that's a good place to wrap this up. It's been uh, it's been really interesting hearing your story, and, and honestly, thanks very much for being so honest and open about. I think so many people go through mental health challenges, mm. come out the other side of it stronger, and and find ways to help manage stuff like that. It's so important we talk about it and and share the fact that even if one person listens to this and goes, "All right, I'm going through something similar here, and I'm not alone," that's really valuable. I think in the world, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really important to, I mean, you know, ultimately talking about it's the first step um, to recovery, isn't it, at the end Absolutely. of the day? Um, and that was, the, that was the one thing that I didn't do for far too long. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, for, for, for me, finding this in my life and finding the team environment and the focus um, has been huge. Um, I, I, I feel at the moment like I'll do this as long as my body lets me, lets me do it. And there are people in the team that, I've, I've done far more than me and I've got many, many years on me. So hopefully I'll be around for a while. So, yeah. Awesome. Good man. All right, listen, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that. I, uh, I really enjoyed talking with Dave. I think his triathlon journey is, is one thing and it's pretty inspiring in itself, but it takes a lot of bravery to come on and talk about mental health issues because you know, rightly or wrongly, there is still stigma around it. And a lot of people struggle. A lot of people have been struggling with, you know, stress and the idea of career related, stress related breakdowns, something that's very close to my heart. because I went through a very similar thing in the year before I left teaching. And it's incredibly hard to talk about it, even to your closest friends, let alone to, you know, to come on a, a podcast and talk about it and share your experience. So, Dave's way of dealing with this or part of the way of dealing with it has been really effective for him to channel himself into exercise and to really treat it as a thing that keeps him mentally well as well as physically well. I think it's brilliant. And um, yeah, I really hope you I really hope you enjoyed that and hope you got something from it. And I just encourage you, if you've got something like that going on, I remember you know, the last year that I had in teaching, the school that I was at went through a pretty turbulent time. Myself and a lot of my a lot of my long-term friends from the school and long-term colleagues went through a very difficult time. And one thing that, you know, we get together now sometimes and talk about this, but one thing we wish is that we'd opened up to each other a little bit more at the time about the struggles that we were going through. And rightly or wrongly at the time, we thought there was strength in silence. And I don't look at it that way at all. Six, seven years later, I look back and I think it, it would have been much better for me. It would have been much better for my friends for us all to kind of talk about and discuss what was going on for us so if that's affected you if you've got something like that going on in your life as well I really encourage you to reach out to somebody close to you and talk about what's going on because talking can make a difference effective counseling effective therapy can make a difference but just having a friendly set of ears with a friend can make a real difference as well just to have your true feelings out there and have somebody validate them so yeah i hope that's helped and i hope that's uh hope that's connected with a few people coach's couch this week i'm going to change tack a little bit here i want to talk to you about um i was on a, a call today with um a young lady who's interested in joining the team and we were talking about her 
personal triathlon journey and you know she's a very fast athlete she's been a podium at 70.3s she's looking at um different coaching options at the moment and one of the one of the key challenges we were looking at here was she had a couple of things going on mainly the big challenge she's faced is she's got a run injury that niggles every time she runs and she hasn't run pain free for a while she'll have a period off running she'll feel that she's cured she'll have treatment she'll get back to running and anytime she got back into what she considered like real sessions the injury flared up again and it's been like this for over a year to 18 months and this constant cycle of being driven to do the run sessions being driven to do hard work because she feels that's what she needs to do to be fast and hey who's not been there right but that flares the injury up which means she's got to take some time off running again which means she's got to take treatment again and when we were when we were taking a step back and looking at her overall racing, the thing that she felt was holding her back was, I really need to work on my swim because I'm a you know 35-ish minute swimmer and I want to be down near 30. So there's four or five minutes I'm giving away there to my competition. And I feel like I should be getting back to my best at my running. So she'd run sort of 144 in her last race and wanted to be down under 140. So again, there's like four or five minutes there. And as I asked her what she wanted and what she was looking for, the focus turned to swimming. I don't feel I'm a very good swimmer. If I was a better swimmer, I'd be out of the water with, you know, more of the girls I want to race. I need to pick up these four or five minutes here. And if I could just, you know, just put some consistent running together, then I could also pick up that time in the run. And I, you know, really, I just want to, I just want to be racing well again. When we drilled right down into it, the thing that was really missing here was, the ability to go and have a run without being in pain. And when we took a step back and looked at it, I was saying, you're talking about putting extra hours into the swim here so you can find a few of these minutes. If we just spent a little bit of that time, you know, by the time you've gone to the pool and done a swim, you've probably taken two hours out of your day. And if you do that two times extra a week, that's four hours out of your week. She's a very busy professional. And she was honest and said, look, the thing that slips is doing my prehab work, doing my rehab work, doing my conditioning work. It'll get pushed to the end of the day and then I won't get it done. And I'd rather go for a swim than I would do the prehab or I'd rather go for a run than I would do the conditioning work. And when we took a step back, I said, if you look at it this way, if we could get your body healthy again, if you could spend the time to do the conditioning work and the prehab work, that would unlock your run. You're not running 144 because you lack the fitness to run a 138 you're running 144 because every step you put down in that race that glute is absolutely murder like someone sticking a knife in there your priority has got to be healing it's got to be getting your body well again we've got to prioritize doing the thing that lets us do the thing we want to do it isn't always the thing we want to do the conditioning work or the prehab work but it's what we have to do in order to be able to do the things that we enjoy the running the biking the swimming and I told a story about one of the one of the physios that I'd seen ages ago who used this analogy and he said, I wish that I could take your running shoes and I could lock them into a little locker and that you had to hang the key to this locker up on the wall above your strength and conditioning mat. And so every time you wanted to go for a run, you would have to go and stand on your strength and conditioning mat to reach onto the wall to get the key. And you would realize that the key to being able to go for a run is to get on that strength and conditioning mat and do the prehab and the conditioning work. And that was something that really got through to me. If I wanted to run pain three, I had to spend, and I still do, spend a lot of time doing conditioning work for my Achilles tendons to stop them being sore and inflamed and blowing up. And when I do the work, you know, I'm no different to anybody else. Sometimes I'm better at it than others. But when I do the work, I have a period of running where I'm pain free. And so lo and behold, I forget about it. I stop doing the work the niggle starts up again and it becomes painful. And this has been a cycle for me for probably the best part of a decade. That piece of information, the idea of having a physical key to unlock the running shoes is a really clever one. And if it's something that you're going through as well, I'd encourage you to take a step back because a story that I often hear is I'm willing to do the work. You know, I want to get faster. I want to win my age group. I'm willing to do the work. But are you really That's my big question to get you to ask yourselves. Are you willing to do the work that you have to do in order to do the work that you want to do? Because we all want to bike and run and swim. 
But are you willing to do the prehab work, the conditioning work, the stuff that's going to get your body its MOT to be able to go out and train? And maybe that's just a little bit of reframing in your head away from, well, you know, the conditioning work can wait to that's actually the thing that's going to allow me to do the things that I enjoy and the things that are fun. Because I guarantee she's going to be faster once she gets the conditioning work done and that glute starts firing and the glute pain goes away then she'll be able to run consistently again as well. Oh, and by the way, let's add in here at the moment, she's doing a lot of fast running, really short intervals on the track, which are making this flare up. But again, the compulsion that we have, the worry is if I don't run fast, I'm never going to run fast in a race. Whereas we know if you run consistently, even if that that consistent running is steady, then that consistent running builds a fantastic base of consistency that makes your body strong and durable. So I hope that's helped you. I hope that's something you'll consider. I hope you'll spend, you know what, even if it's only three minutes lying down on the conditioning mat and doing some glute activation work, some single legged hip bridges, those three minutes will absolutely be worth their weight in gold and pay back massive, massive dividends for you. If you want to find out more, if you want to book a call with me and have a chat about coaching and how we could work with you, there's a link in the show notes. I think with Team Oxygen Addict, we've got the most comprehensive triathlon coaching program for busy age groupers. So as well as getting your training plan for you and your events and coach support, um, both within our group coaching calls and within our Facebook group, we've also got official partners with Performance Chef. So you get meal plans to go along with your plan with Matt Bosch for bike fitting. So you've got advice and webinars about position and aerodynamics and discounts on his bike fitting service. Um, personalized hydration calls from our partners, Precision Hydration and discount with them. And also HRV for training. So you get heart rate variability guidance so that your training plan alters on a day-to-day basis based on how ready your body is to train that day. And there's too much to go into there in a separate podcast. But if that resonates with you, if the idea of if you've ever thought, I don't know whether I should train today or not. I don't know whether I'm being soft or whether I am really, really too tired out and stressed to train. HRV and the app HRV for training can be the key to unlocking that alongside a decent training plan and proper coaching advice. Okay, come join us on Tuesday, 7.15 p.m. UK time on the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast Power Hour. Get on Zwift, come and train with us. Uh, you'll get some of the sessions that we use with the team and I guarantee you'll love it. It's workouts that are guaranteed to raise your FTP and give you a faster, more powerful bike leg this coming season. All right, let's wrap it up then. So discount codes and deals for you. PrecisionHydration.com. Use the code OxygenAddict15 for 15% off your electrolyte order. GroupEvolution.com. Use the code OxygenAddict15 for 15% off training camp with none other than the man, Dave Scott. Again, click the link in the show notes for details there. And over at TeamOxygenAddict.com, you can book a call with me to discuss your coaching and training plan needs. We think we've got the most comprehensive triathlon coaching program out there for busy age groupers. And remember, there's links in the show notes for all these sponsors, so you don't have to remember them. All right, everybody. Until next week, have a great, safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby, and you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. See ya. See ya.